Welcome to another thing. I'm Larry Menti. We are at the observatory atop the world famous Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Right over here is the Zeiss telescope, one of the most famous telescopes in the world. It was brought here in 1934. It has a twin. It's out at Griffith Park in Los Angeles. You may have seen it in the movie La La Land. We're bringing the show from here today because it's been a long time since space exploration has made headlines like it has recently. What with SpaceX reusing a rocket for a launch, making tourism in space more of a reality. Also, they've discovered new planets, they've discovered a brand new solar system that they believe has planets that can sustain life just like ours. And that's a good thing because the smartest man in the world has a dire warning that within a thousand years, we better find another place to live. We'll be talking about those topics and a whole lot more with the chief astronomer here, Derek Pitts. And we are joined now by a guy I like to call the smartest guy I know, chief astronomer at the Ben Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, Derek Pitts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, let's let's get right into it, because there's, yes. there's so much to cover. Yes. Let's start with the latest news, SpaceX. They were able to, the private company that's been launching rockets, they were able to reuse a rocket. Why is that significant? The reason why that's significant, Larry, is because of the fact that the future of space exploration really is tied up into being able to drive down the cost of access to Earth orbit. And so what SpaceX is doing by reusing its launch vehicles is it's reducing the cost of getting into space. So you build a launch system, right, a rocket, a booster, a second stage with a payload, and you launch it, and then you throw away a piece that could be reused. That means every time you launch, you're going to have to rebuild that and launch it and throw it away again. And so the cost of that is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So if you can reuse a launch booster, then what that does is it drives down the cost and makes it easier for you to gain access to space. That takes us right into space tourism because there, there's talks, I mean, it's a reality now. They're, they're already planning trips yes. to the moon, to space. Yes. How do you feel about that? So the way you have to think of this really is in the same way that we have come to love commercial aviation. Nowadays, we don't blink when we get on a commercial aircraft to fly from Philadelphia to Beijing on an 18-hour flight, and we complain the risk has been driven so far down in that that we no longer think of it. So that's the same as what's happening here in space tourism, is that we have the entrepreneurs beginning now, those taking the highest risk. But in about 50 years, that risk is going to be driven so far down that almost anybody will be able to visit space and live that dream that you and I grew up with of being able to travel in space. I didn't grow up with it. I'm sure you did. I, I didn't grow up with that dream. Would you be one of the first? Of course. I'd you go would, right. You of course wouldn't. I would. Sure. No, I wouldn't blink at it. And the reason why is because it's the ultimate exploration experience. Imagine being up above the Earth, 65, 70 miles, looking down on this planet, seeing the curvature of the Earth, the unity of the planet, because there are no political borders. You wouldn't want to have that experience. You are a space romantic in your heart. You're right. I am a romantic. You're right about that. And when we speak of it that way, I also have to acknowledge that, yes, there is risk. And as we go further into space exploration, we also have to de-romanticize it because, you know, the fantasy that people have is that we're going to develop all this capability to take people in, into space. So what do you make of Stephen Hawking saying we have a thousand years, we're now on the clock to find another planet to live in because this planet will not be livable? I think the point that he's trying to make is that we, we have the responsibility to do something to make this planet or keep this planet a place where humans can live. And the idea that we have a thousand years to get off this planet and find some place else where humans can live, I mean, that's a great challenge for exploration for the human species. I mean, we love to explore and everything, but again, the reality is that, number one, we're talking about thousands or millions of people leaving this planet, but to go where? Venus is not a place to go, it's too hot. Mars is not a place to go, it doesn't have what we need. Even if we tried to terraform Mars, we still couldn't do it to the scale we need or in the time we need to make it possible for We've humans to go years. there. Oh, that's not much, my friend. Just remember, here we are now in 2017. What were things like here on this planet in 1917, a century ago? Yes, much more advanced. 
but could we possibly have moved a majority of people from one continent to another continent? Yes, there was lots of immigration taking place, but we're talking about billions of people. Not possible. Then let's add one other piece to that that's really important. We must make sure we tack onto this, and that is even if we can identify another Earth-like planet someplace, the closest planet of any kind that we know of outside our own solar system is four light years away. Is that the planet that they've spotted recently when they saw, they saw a new solar system yes, and they believed Proxima it was B. a planet? Yes, that's right. This is a place where they have identified, well, there's two. One place that's four light years away, another place I think that's eight light years away where we've identified planets that might be like Earth. But that's if you travel at the speed of light. 300,000 kilometers per second, 186,000 miles per second. We don't have that capability to do that. So how do we do that? Well, we built a spacecraft. We put several thousand people into it. And then their children's 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 children might make it to that location at some point if everything goes well. Unless we speed up travel. Unless we do that. But if we look at the laws of physics, the laws of physics say that we can't make that happen to an effective enough rate of speed. We can't get to half the speed of light. It takes too much energy. The spacecraft has to be too big anyway. So how are we going to get the energy we need to drive that mass at that speed? It's very complicated. I, I want to talk about the, the fact that there may be 110 planets in our solar system. And this has to do with just redefining what a planet is, right? Yes. Is, is this Pluto remorse? <laughs> you know, I'm very thankful that the idea of a new way to define planets allows us to bring Pluto back into the fold again. But this was a really necessary thing for planetary scientists to think about. How do we define what a planet is? If we were looking at just our solar system, what we'd find is that the definition that has been used over the last half century or so has been really very confining, very restrictive, and applies only to this solar system. The reason why this group of scientists has come up with a different way to define what a planet is is because now we've been discovering planets orbiting other stars. In fact, the number of candidates for planets orbiting other stars in a small corner of our galaxy alone is over 4,000. And of those 4,000, more than 2,500 have been confirmed as planets orbiting other stars. And that's in a very small corner of our galaxy alone. So when we look at this new definition of planets, it allows us to take into account not only the classic planets that we know of, but lots of other objects in our solar system that orbit the sun, that have pulled themselves into nearly a spherical shape. And that's the only definition, oh, along with the fact that they seem to be built rocky bodies very much like the other bodies are in our solar system. So then that opens the door for lots of other objects in our solar system to be identified as planets. As so we get to all these planets and we find other solar systems, it's become arrogant, it's become ignorant to believe that we're the only life? I think it's really more of a mathematical situation for us to consider. It's a probability thing more so than anything else. And what I mean by that is scientists are now using a statistical understanding to indicate that perhaps it's much more likely for a star to have planets or a planet than to not have a planet. So if we look at the mathematics that way, that means that in our galaxy alone we have at least 250 billion planets. At least that many stars, at least that many stars, and if each has a planet that's 250 in this galaxy alone, 250 billion in this galaxy alone. Now, if we extend the number of galaxies that are understood to be in existence, let's say we make it 100 billion just to be on the low side, Larry, and each one of those has a planet, well, then the number of planets is absolutely uncountable. So that says that probability would dictate that some of those planets must have life. Right. When we come back, thank you, I told you he's the smartest guy I know. When we come back, I want to talk about the future of NASA if it does have a future, and also a secret space shuttle that may carry weapons when another thing continues.